Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today evening. And today I'll speak on a topic which is of relevance to all of us. That is, how do we know what is the right thing to do in life? That is the question of Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita and that is the question that drives the Mahabharata. So, Prichamitam Dharma Sammudha Chetaha Arjuna asks Krishna in 2.7 What is Dharma? Now, Dharma is not just some religious code. Dharma is actually the right thing to do. The action that keeps us in harmony with the nature of reality. The action that is harmonious with who we are and who we are meant to be. So, now we all know that there are times in our life when we have to make decisions. At one level, at every moment we have to make decisions. So right now you made a decision to come for this program or not come for this program. Even when you are sitting for this program, you make a decision whether to pay attention or not pay attention. <laughs> so, now, there are some decisions which are relatively easy to make. Some decisions are very difficult to make. So there are, broadly speaking, you could say two kinds of confusions. There could be moral confusion and there is ethical confusion. Sometimes moral and ethical are used in interchangeable sense. But moral confusion is where there is, uh, path A is right and path B is wrong. But still we just don't have the moral strength to do what is right. Whereas ethical confusion is where we don't know what is right. And so we need to function in life, we often say that we need values. Now what do we mean by values? Actually values we talk about honesty, truthfulness, uh, trustworthiness or whatever, we can talk about these values. But what do we actually mean by values? See, our values uh, determine what we consider as valuable. What we consider as valuable is reflected by our values. So if somebody values, say, punctuality, and then if somebody comes late, they will just not be able to bear it. I had gone for one place for a program. I had one program on Sunday, and the next program was after. Uh, two hours. I had a meeting with one of the leaders over there and I left. So the ETA was saying that it will take about one hour and I was going to reach about five minutes late. So I was in anxiety. And I called the preachers and I said that, you know, you please start Kirtan and I'll come. And I was in anxiety and they were remarkably cool. <laughs> and then finally I reached at 5.30 and I rushed to the temple. There was nobody there. <laughs> I said, what happened? He said, we know preachers come late, so the program is 6.30, but we told you 5.30. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so now, if somebody is very time conscious, I will get very angry. So, uh, how could you do like this? So, our values reflect what is valuable for us. So now we all say that we need values, which is true. But we also need not just values, we need the right hierarchy of values. That means sometimes two values may come in conflict. Say, <clears throat> if, if we are, say one value might be truthfulness, we should always be the truth, which is important. So, if somehow, <laughs> say we have a friend who is being targeted by some violent people, Maybe some riot is going on and that person friend comes to our house, please save me. And we hide our friend in our, in our basement or somewhere. And then those riot years come and knock on the door. Is he there? <laughs> so what should we do? What do you think we should do? We cannot tell the truth. So I may say I have the value of truthfulness, but the value of truthfulness is not enough. I need the right hierarchy of values. Speaking truth is important, but preserving life is even more important. And the right hierarchy of values means that I value life more than preserving life, more than speaking the truth. So, when there is dharma sammoha, dharma sammoha, as it happens in the Mahabharata, in the start of the Bhagavad Gita, it is 
what is the right hierarchy of values? So, uh, Arjuna is confused about that. Mm -hmm. And this is a very complicated question. Because sometimes we may all have different roles to do in the start of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Arjuna has this question, Dharma Samu Vichita. I want to know what is Dharma. And Krishna answers by giving an elaborate philosophy and sometimes we feel, where is the answer to the philosophy? He says, well, see, the philosophy is actually helping us build a hierarchy of values. And then through that hierarchy of values, we can, uh, we can apply that to specific questions. So, broadly speaking, with respect to ethics, ethics is basically about uh, what is the right thing to do, same question. There are two broad understandings of ethics. That one is categorical ethics and the other is contextual ethics. Categorical ethics is that this is the category of right and that is the category of wrong. And this is what we should do and this is what we should not do. And we see in the Mahabharata, there are some, in fact the whole Mahabharata is actually evolution of characters from categorical ethics towards contextual ethics. So we see two characters who are stuck with categorical ethics throughout and they don't meet a very good end. Those are Karana and Vishnu. Now Yudhishthir also starts with categorical ethics but then gradually he moves towards contextual ethics. So a simple example I can I presume that everybody knows the basic story of the Mahabharata? I will mention the basic incidents wherever I am describing, but I won't go into the story at this point. So now, see how categorical ethics would be utterly impractical or would be totally counterproductive. So Yudhishthir is known to be very truthful. He is Dharmaraj. But the Pandavas have to live the terms of the exile. Does anyone know what were the terms of the exile for the Pandavas? What were they? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? They should live incognito for one year. Yeah, incognito for one year after 12 years of exile. Now if they are going to live incognito and anybody asks you, they still, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> now, if he speaks the truth at that time, it's over, isn't it? So, at that point, he just can't speak the truth. So, speaking the truth is important. But the context is such that speaking the truth will instantly defeat the purpose of what he's trying to do. So, he has this categorical ethics. He says, initially he has this idea that Dhritarashtra is like a father figure for me. And whatever Dhritarashtra says, I will obey. And Dhritarashtra, through Vidura, calls him for a gambling match. And Yudhishthira has no desire to gamble. But he can't refuse. And then he is incited and he just gambles everything away. It's a disastrous loss. So he has, he has this virtue of being truthful, which is very good. But he recognizes that that is not the only way to act all the time. Now again, I am not licensing speaking lies. We don't want to say that we can any time and then for our convenience we start speaking lies. That's not the point. The point is, is that how all this is applied has to be very carefully done. But I'm giving you this as a simple example of how categorical ethics will not work. So even from a simple perspective, say if I come into America and now I might be, I'm not, but I might be very spiritually realized and I may understand I'm a soul and I belong to the spiritual world. If they ask me what is my name, I am a soul. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot write that. From where, where I come, from the spiritual world. <laughs> so even if that is my spiritual understanding, you know, I cannot write that. So, we have, there is, um, there are multiple levels of reality also. It is a reality that we are all souls. But it is also a reality that we are citizens of a particular country. It is a reality that at present, based on our body and it's where we have been born, we have a particular name, we have a particular skin color. So all these we can't change. So the point is that truth, speaking the truth is a virtue, but we have to look at the context. 
So categorical ethics is this is the right thing and this is always the right thing. Context doesn't matter. Hmm? Contextual ethics is yes, we accept categories. This is right, this is wrong. But between white and black, there are shades of grey. And in those shades of grey is where most of our life is. Not most, it's a significant part of our life is. And how we navigate that is important. So when scripture teaches us dharma, it doesn't simply give us law codes. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Yes, there are some principles which are do's and don'ts. But life is extremely complex. And we can't simply impose law codes on all situations without considering the situation. So let's look at, so Yudhishthiri starts with categorical ethics. I will always obey my elders. I will always speak the truth. But eventually when he sees that he is put in a condition, situation in cognitive exile, he just can't speak the truth. Otherwise, again he will have to go to a So he is put in a situation where he can't speak the truth. When he finds his elders are manipulating him or exploiting him instead of protecting him, he still does not, he never, is never openly disrespectful towards Dhritarashtra. But Dhritarashtra uses a very cunning strategy toward the, just before the Kurukshetra war is about to happen. He says, Oh Yudhishthira, everybody who is a Grihastha has to renounce the world and eventually take Vanaprastha. He says, you are so fortunate, you are already a Vanaprastha. Why do you want to become a Grihastha? Just stay in the forest. <laughs> and this is what is called rationalize. Have you heard the word rationalize? What is the spelling of rationalize? R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-L-I-E-S Rational lies. <laughs> when we rationalize, we tell rational lies. <laughs> so, the lies that sound rational. Now yes, it is true that after Grahastha one should be getting the retired order of life. But that philosophy is being used very cynically to deprive the Pandavas of their rights and to let Duryodhana have his ill-gotten gains. So, Dhrishtar is very firm and polite, very polite, but still he's firm. And he says that, no, we have not yet completed our duties to our ancestors. We have not yet uh, begotten children to continue our lineage. We have not yet performed our duty to the sages. Generally, there are, uh, there are various duties which you have to do. And that's why we cannot take one person right now. To use his reasons. But the point is, at this stage, that uh, he doesn't simply uncritically obey his elders. Now again, uh, I am not justifying rejecting or disrespecting one's elders again. I will have to give this caveat repeatedly. The point is that no value can be uncritically established as a supreme value without considering context. So, contextual ethics means we have to look at three things. What do we mean by context? Context means situation. And what does the situation determine? Broadly speaking, there is the particular action that we are going to do. Now, when we have contextual ethics, that means we consider three things. Not just the content of the action, what I am doing, but the intent and also the consequence. The, con the in content, intent and consequence. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And what will be the result of doing this? So all these three need to be considered. So I am speaking a lie when some, of the, when some variety has asked me, is, is your friend there at your house? No. So why am I speaking this? So that I can save some life. So, uh, so we have to consider the intent and the consequence along with the content. And this is the evolution that the Mahabharata goes through. The, the leading characters of the Mahabharata go through. And some people who are stuck with the idea of context, categorical ethics, they say the Pandavas also did wrong. They also did some things wrong. Yes, they did certain things wrong. But if you consider that Purapas was virtuous, their purpose was, they were dharmic, they were virtuous and they wanted to establish the rule of virtue. So, the world is not a, uh, not a, uh, 
not an ideal place. So we want to live according to ideals. But we also have to recognize how people are. And sometimes if our ideals are going to be exploited by others, then we have to we have to we have to we have to live for the ideals, but we have to live in the real world for those ideals. So how to do that? It's always a challenge. So now let's put it this way: that there are good people who sometimes do bad things, and there are good people who do good things. There are bad people who do bad things. And in between, there are good people who do bad things, and there are bad people who do good things. So now, how do we decide somebody is good or bad? It's not so easy. But broadly, we would say that there is weakness and there is wickedness. Weakness is something which we all have. Say weakness means uh, we all have say anger or greed or lust or whatever. And under the influence, we come up with such force that we end up doing something wrong. But then after that, we regret it. Hey, I shouldn't have done this. So we have intelligence. Hey, I should not have done this. We have conscience. Which says, intelligence helps us rationally understand. Hey, I shouldn't have done this. Conscience makes us feel bad after we have done bad. So <laughs> those who have weakness, they they recognize I have done wrong. But those who have wickedness, their conscience has become completely deadened. They do bad and they don't feel bad about doing bad. In fact, they do bad and think, just see how clever I am, how much pain I can cause to this person. And their intelligence doesn't think about how to control their anger or lust or greed. Their intelligence becomes a servant of their lust, anger, greed. And they use their intelligence to scheme to act in a way that will that they can be greedy, they can be violent, and then they can, they can get away with it. So, if you consider a spectrum, weakness and wickedness. So, weakness is something which is reformable. Wickedness is also reformable. But wickedness, at least a person needs, needs to begin with a desire to reform. Often people with wickedness have no desire to reform also. Because they don't think anything is wrong. So what Yudhishthir did, say in the gambling match, it was a, at one level, we could say Yudhishthir is transcendental, is pure devotee, and everything is orchestrated by the Lord. That's true. But if we want to learn some ethical lessons for our behavior, for our, then we can say that we can say that okay, the action that Yudhishthir did over there was wrong. Now it is a grievous wrong. He was he was provoked by the circumstances, but he gambled everything away. And Yudhishthir himself says, when Draupadi is furious with him in the forest, he says, how could you gamble your brothers? How could you gamble me? And he says, in the heat of the moment, through gambling I got carried away. So some people uh, uh, they say that oh you know if Yudhishthir also gambled. And why can't we gamble? Now, if you see what scripture is teaching is a very different lesson. It is saying that if a person as virtuous as Yudhishthir, if he gambles, he gets into so much trouble. If we gamble, then what will happen to us? <laughs> <laughs> so, we see that here, that what, it was a moment of weakness. And it was very cynically and very... Uh, viciously exploited by Duryodhan, Chakuni and company. So it led to, led to terrible loss, but he regretted it. And he didn't do that again. Like one of the things that Yudhishthir did in the forest was he learned gambling. And he said, I already got in so much trouble by gambling, why do you learn gambling? But he knew that Duryodhan might challenge him for another gambling match. And he wanted to be prepared for that. So he uh, didn't gamble for this gambling sake, but he learned, and he, he repented his mistake and he tried to correct it. So that's weak, weakness which was overcome. Now Duryodhan, he represents not weakness, but wickedness. Now he had, he tried to poison the Pandavas, he tried to poison Dima, he tried to burn the Pandavas along with their mother. Then he 
defrauded the Pandavas and everything, tried to dishonor their wife. Did all this, and at the end of it, when after the Pandavas lived for 13 years, as per the terms of the exile, he was not ready to give anything back to them. And he, he the, all the sages and elders were advising him, that don't promote the Pandavas, give them back their kingdom. And he said, that why are you blaming me? After great introspection, I don't see anything wrong that I have done. And he said, if at all I have done anything wrong, I am simply acting according to my nature. So if anyone is to be blamed, you blame the creator who gave me my nature. <laughs> now, see, our past, uh, it explains our emotions. Sometimes some people may be very short-tempered. Our past explains our emotions, but our past doesn't excuse our actions. Somebody may have a tendency to be short-tempered. But just because I am short-tempered doesn't mean I can take a gun and shoot people. So our, we, we have to consider our past. But we, if, if we blame our past for our actions, then what, we, what it means is we are acknowledging that we have no power at all. So we are products of our past. But we are not prisoners of our past. Our past shapes who we are and it creates certain pushes within us. But we have free will and by that free will we can counter push. So Dhritaraj, so Duryodhan did not feel that I have done anything wrong. And that was wickedness. And that's why, see weakness can be given forgiveness. But to offer forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness. <laughs> suppose some terrorists are there and they are shooting around people indiscriminately. And then their gun power gets over, and they are police, and they are shooting, and then I say, oh, I'm sorry, please, I, I surrender, forgive me. And then the policeman puts the gun down, and the police fixes the gun and shoots the police. You know, if, uh, of course this is, example can be elaborated, but the point I'm making is that you cannot, if forgiveness is important, and forgiveness, for most of our relationships, we shouldn't assume that people have wickedness. Most people have weakness. But if somebody doesn't even feel that they're doing anything wrong and they keep repeatedly doing that, then at that time to offer forgiveness is foolishness. They'll only hurt us more. So now, uh, here what we're talking about is how do we know the right thing to do? So some people say, why did Arjuna, Krishna tell Arjuna to fight the war? No, God should, uh, why should, we should have peace. Yes, we should have peace. But, you see, nowadays the United Nations, it sends all over the world peacekeeping force. <laughs> now, you need force to keep peace. <laughs> now, force also means violence. So there are times when certain people, that you need, and you need aggression to prevent aggression. You need aggression to prevent aggression. So, for wickedness, what is the right thing to do? You cannot simply have indiscriminate forgiveness. So, they, they still followed that. But it only made things worse and worse and worse. Initially, when Abhima was poisoned, they still said, it's a family issue, no, we just be more careful, don't make a big issue out of it. And then, even, even when they were attempted to be burned alive, they escaped. When they came back, they didn't blame the Kauravas. They just acted as if, okay, something happened. And they didn't, they put the past behind them. But when Draupadi was dishonored, a line was crossed. And then, and, that, and eventually, even after 12, 13 years, when they came back and Duryodhan had no remorse, no reformation, then they said that we cannot have forgiveness over here. So for us, so now let's look at, I talk about these two characters. We have Yudhishthir and we have Duryodhan. Now, in between, we have various shades of grey. So sometimes good people might do bad things, and sometimes bad people might also do good things. Duryodhan did one good thing was that he had Karna in his moment of need. When Karna was uh, not allowed to compete, he said, I make, I'll make you Kshatriya, I'll give you a king. So he did a good thing at that time. And there's no need to deny that he did a good thing. But 
he had his own purposes over there. He wanted to use Karna as a foil for Arjuna. So now let's look at these two characters, Karna and Bhishma. Now both of them to some extent operate based on categorical ethics. What is that? For Bhishma, he had made a vow that I will always protect the ruling king of the Kuru dynasty. Now he had taken a vow long ago based on uh, where his father wanted to marry Satyavati and he wanted his father to be married to the woman she, he wanted to marry. I don't know the whole story. But he had taken a vow at that time. And he stuck to that way. And then he was told that I will... Uh, but what about you may not become the king. But what about your children? He said, I won't have children. I won't marry. So he took that vow uh, for a very noble purpose. Now at that time when he took that vow, he would have had probably no idea that a wicked person like Duryodhan would ever be the effective ruler. <laughs> Although Duryodhan was not the king, see the, the Dhritarashtra was on the was on the throne, but Duryodhan was in power. So in India, before the current government, there was something similar. There was one. <laughs> <laughs> there was one, one person who was in the Prime Minister's office and the other person in power. <laughs> so now, he would probably never have imagined that somebody like him would be the king. And he felt obliged that I have to fight for the Kauravas, for the Kuru king. And thus, in the Kuru battlefield, he chose to stay on the side of the Kauravas. Now, Karana also took a vow that he said, Oh Duryodhan, you will have my eternal friendship. You have saved my honor, you have given me the honor of being a king, you have accepted me the rank of Kshatriyas and intended to Now, at that time, even Karana couldn't have imagined that Duryodhan would go to the extent of that he did. Okay. See, we don't really come to know people in one or two encounters. What does mean one or two encounters, you know? Uh, we live with ourselves and we don't know ourselves also. <laughs> okay, sometimes we do something, hey, what, what did I do? And then somebody else asks us, why did you do that? And then we have to come up with some explanation. Because we ourselves don't know, why, why did I do that? So we, everybody is complex. We ourselves are complex, others are complex. So now, when he came to know that Duryodhan was so vicious. So we could say, in this case, that <coughs> Karana, he was a virtuous person, he, he was charitable, he was uh, chivalrous, he was, uh, he was a hero in many ways. But he got in touch with Duryodhan. And see, there is, there is, when there is weakness and when there is wickedness, and when the two come together, then either usually what happens is wickedness drags weakness down. Just like say the students go to college. I was in a year in university of speaking recently, and the college, the ethics department head, he came and was talking with me that you know we have a drug epidemic in America. And there are drug peddlers. See, students, student life is stressful. There's so much competition, there's so much peer pressure, so many things are there. The students feel stressed. So they have weaknesses. I just want some relief from stress. And there are people with wickedness. There are drug peddlers. Just looking for somebody with weakness. And they will give a free sample and then they will hope the students. So if weakness associates with wickedness, then usually weakness gets dragged down to wickedness. Now that's what happened to Karana. So uh, Karna, he initially was very honorable and when Duryodhan was making various schemes to, against the Pandavas, he said, why do you do all this? Let's call them to a fight, defeat them and we will take the kingdom in a fair fight. Shakuni said, no, you are just a child, you don't know politics. And Duryodhan was more influenced by Shakuni than by Karna. And eventually it went so much that uh, he... 
all of us, we need a place where we are accepted for who we are. And if, if that emotional need of being accepted is uh, fulfilled by someone, we become put over, we become uh, very indebted to them. And sometimes that emotion, no, I mean, gratitude is a good emotion. But sometimes gratitude can blind us. And in this case, he, he also, he so desperately wanted a sense of belonging to the, both the Kauravas that he actually ended up acting in wicked ways. In the gambling match, it was he who suggested, now that Draupadi has won, drag her into the assembly. Make her one of the serving mates. Let's just go her. This suggestion came to Karma. And this is horrible. Then, of course, later Karna regrets it. He says, in order to please, to please Duryodhana, I acted terribly in the assembly. But what happened? He was not wicked, but he did act not just with weakness, but wickedness at times. Now, eventually, when the war came, before that, Krishna came and told Karna that you, know, you are the eldest Pandava and you can become the king. And you will have the king, you will have the honor that you want, and you will also have the side of virtue. But he operated based on categorical things. I have given my word to my friend Duryodhan, even if I die, I will stick to it. But what was his friend doing? His friend was acting is viciously. There might be some question, actions which are questionable, but trying to draw a dishonor Draupadi. And you defraud the Pandavas. There's no question about the wrongness of those actions. So, by his categorical ethics, he refused Krishna's offer. And thus, he courted his own death. So, Karana had a choice between a world, the world of honor and a life of honor. Should I honor my word or should I live a life that is honorable by choosing Karma? Unfortunately, Operating on categorical ethics, he chose the word of honor. Now, something similar happens, we could say, even with Bhishma. But we see that Bhishma never degenerates to wickedness. Bhishma tries to oppose uh, what the heinous act of Draupadi is Roma. But at that time, he gets, because Bhishma operates very much in a rule bound and this conception of dharma. So, Draupadi raises the question over there that, uh, as he's, he says that, or oh, Draupadi raises the question that if Yudhishthira had gambled himself before, and he is not his own master, then how can he be my master? How can he gamble me? And then Bhishma says, no, yes, this is, he says that, because Yudhishthira, he, he gambled you. So, he says, uh, wife belongs to the husband, the husband belongs to the wife. Uh, so, normally, a wife belongs to the husband. But if the husband is not his own master, can the wife husband gamble? Does the husband, anyone belong to the husband if he doesn't belong to himself? He says, there are these two principles and they are confusing. So, I don't know what is right. So, he gets victimized here by what is called as Niyamagra. Niyamagra is getting caught in the letter of the law and forgetting the purpose of the law. Okay, whether, you know, whether a uh, husband, wife belongs to the husband or not. The more important thing is that a woman should not be dishonored. Is it? Forget the technicalities of the law. But he gets too caught in the technicalities. So we could say that he, he does come, he gives a mistake on his part also. But it is, it is more hmm, passivity amidst wickedness rather than active wickedness. What Karana does is active wickedness. And another thing is that Krishna never approaches Bhishma. That you come and fight on the side of the cow, Pandavas. Now here we, so we could say that Bhishma also operates according to categorical ethics. And from one perspective, because Bhishma remains silent, at least he actively forcefully stop the disrobing of Draupadi, that's why he has to face a very painful end. Now he, his, his body pierced by so many arrows. And it's one thing to have the body pierced by arrows, but to stay like that for days upon days upon days. That's extremely painful. So that's one understanding of it. So he does get 
the so here what we see is uh, that he does get the consequence of the action, but he is not somebody who is actively wicked. So both of them operate on categorical ethics, and they meet with a not such a good end. They end up choosing the wrong party, but at the same time, there's a higher understanding of this. Just like I said, I might view my identity that I am Indian, but then there is a higher level of identity also that I am also so. We can have various various levels of identity. So similarly, uh, if 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 you have a computer, you know, mainframe computer, like it's a big central computer for a big organization. Now some people, uh, those are data entry operators, they just have access to some area of the computer where they just put in the data. Somebody is a higher level officer, they have access to many more files in the computer. Somebody is a CEO, they may have access to everything in the computer. So similarly, there is the concept of adhikar. Adhikar is level of authority. So when we study a scripture, according to our adhikar, we get a certain understanding of scripture. So at the level of ordinary analysis, Bhishma does act wrongly based on categorical ethics, but there is a higher understanding, and that understanding is revealed in the Mahabharata. So the Mahabharata gives this operational understanding, and the Mahabharata says that actually Bhishma is a pure devotee. Now, if he's a pure devotee, why does he act wrongly? Why does he stay on the wrong side? That is because Krishna wants him to be there, and that's why, as I said earlier, Krishna never goes to Bhishma to tell him to come on the Pandavas side. Now, why would Krishna want Bhishma to be on the opposite side? Multiple reasons. One is that Krishna wants to demonstrate that even if a person as illustrious as Bhishma chooses the side of Adharma, he will fall. Dharma will win. And adharma will fall no matter who backs adharma. Another thing is, Duryodhan, sorry, Bhishma and Krishna have a very extraordinary relationship. It's called Viryas, where Krishna wants to see Bhishma as an aggressor fighting against him and his devotee. And there is an amazing incident when the same Krishna who has taken a vow, I will not raise any weapons, when Bhishma is about to kill. Uh, Bhishma is about to kill Arjuna. Now Arjuna is can't fight one heartedly. Arjuna feels that you know this is this is my grandfather. He said when I was a small child, I would come back to playing and the, in the fields and I would sit on his uh, clothes and I would soil his clothes by my feet and then I would play with his beard and I would ask him, Father, Father, and then he would fondle my hair and say, Child, I am not your father. I am the father of your father. <laughs> so he said, "We had such. He says, How can I fight against this person?" So now Arjuna is fighting half-heartedly, and Bhishma is fighting wholeheartedly. Bhishma doesn't want to hurt Arjuna, but Bhishma wants to, the world to know how much Krishna loves his devotees, and as he wants to see what Krishna will do to protect his devotees, and with that devotional intention. So the in, as I talked about the intent, content, and consequence. So the content seems he's been fighting against the Lord and his devotees, but intent he wants the world to know how much the Lord loves his devotees, and as he fights wholeheartedly, as he fights wholeheartedly, slowly it becomes clear that Arjuna is going to get wounded. Arjuna may be killed also, and Krishna becomes pensive, and then Krishna looks around and he sees nearby. A wheel. Now on that battlefield there were swords, there were bows and arrows, there were spears. Why a wheel? Now Krishna is so anxious that he sees that wheel and that reminds him of his own Sudarshan Chakra. And he just at one level is on the chariot, next at one moment is on the chariot, next moment is jumped off the chariot, ran to the wheel and picked up the wheel. Now normally if people fight with swords, they are close to each other. If you are fighting with the arrows, there is some distance. So there is some distance between Krishna, Arjuna and Bhishma. So Krishna starts whirling the wheel and charging towards Bhishma. And as soon as Bhishma sees Krishna charging, Bhishma puts on his bow. He says, oh Keshava, death at your hands in the perfection of my life. And Krishna is so angry. He says, you are the cause of this war. If a king goes on the wrong track, it is the duty of the minister to stop him. Because you failed to stop the Rashtra, you are the cause of this war. So I am charging towards him. And Bhishma is saying, I tried my best. 
But if there are still so attached to you, then you never listen to me. You are the best judge of things. Now when Arjuna sees this, oh Krishna has jumped off his chair and Krishna is running. <laughs> Arjuna is concerned not about his own life. He is concerned about Krishna's honor. Krishna has taken a vow that I will not raise a weapon. And although Sudarsh Chakrabhil is not a weapon, but critics will say it's a weapon. And you use it as a weapon. <laughs> so then he calls out to Krishna, stop, I will fight, I will kill Bhishma, please don't, you don't raise weapons. But Krishna is blinded, Krishna doesn't hear at all. And then Arjuna jumps off his chariot and runs. Now Krishna has already got a head start. <laughs> so now Arjuna just runs and it's like a, in, like a flying tackle. And he catches Krishna's foot from below. And Krishna is running so fast that Krishna drags Arjuna along. And Arjuna finally, so they come, Bhishma and Krishna just come very close to each other. Finally, Arjuna raises his heavy kshatriya legs and bangs them on the ground. When he bangs them on the ground, it's such force that it creates a ditch in the field. And his leg gets stuck in the ditch. And, and now his legs are in the ditch and he's holding on to Krishna's foot. Krishna's legs. And then Krishna comes to a grinding stop. And that time Krishna says, Arjuna says, Krishna, I will fight all our day. Please don't break your vow. And then at that time Krishna, now Krishna comes to you could say, external consciousness. <laughs> now Krishna, we don't see any other time, let's say when Shishupal was there, Krishna just sends you to Chakra from there itself. So Krishna doesn't run to Shishupal and then sends Chakra. Now he could have hurled the wheel from here also. But Krishna was so anxious for the protection of Arjuna that suppose you want to, if you are shooting somebody from a distance, you might miss. So you go close and shoot point blank. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, he wants to make sure that I don't miss Bhishma. So he goes right up to him. <laughs> so this is Bhishma's devotional heart. And that is why, so although he had this, all of us have particular natures. And sometimes we can't change our nature. Somebody might be, somebody might be short-tempered, and even after practicing bhakti, they may remain short tempered. See, different people's so, uh, some people's anger might be more circumstantial. Some people might some people's anger might be very deep rooted. So they may be very devotees. They may be very deep devotees, very serious devotees. But still, they, they will be serious angry devotees. <laughs> <laughs> Their anger will be for Krishna only. But still, it will be anger. Hmm? So now, for some people, their anger is quite superficial. Their anger gets purified and goes away. So we can't just. Hey, you get so angry, how can you be a devotee? Not like that. If overall their life is devoted to Krishna, if sometimes anger comes up, we don't take it that seriously. Of course, we have to be cautious in dealing with them. But the point is that he had, he operated upon the categorical ethics because that's what he, that's how he used to think. But that did not impede his devotion. And eventually, Krishna recognized his devotion. And that's why Krishna came to him. So, if he had simply been an attached person who chose the wrong side because he operated in categorical ethics, then Krishna wouldn't have brought Yudhishthir to Bhishma to give instruction to him. And Bhishma gives elaborate instructions. Although he's on the arrow bed, his consciousness is so elevated, and Krishna blesses him with transcendental consciousness, that he gives elaborate instructions. The Shanti Parva and the Anushasana Parva are two big Parvas in the Mahabharata where Bhishma's instructions to the Yudhishthira are given. Amazing, amazingly profound instructions are there over there. So the point is that Krishna recognizes Bhishma's devotion and he rewards Bhishma's devotion. Pashyabhumagnu Pashyabhupanu Kampitam So, Thapi Kanta Bhakteshu Pashyabhupanu Kampitam Sakshat Krishna Darshana Magata Yen makes you stajata Sakshat Krishna Darshana Magata. So he says that just see how merciful Krishna is to his unflinching devotee that at the moment of death he has come to give his personal darshan to me. And Vishma has what is his perfect departure. So Bhishma does make some wrong choices, we could say at an operational level. 
Now, the wrong choices have consequences. He fights on the wrong side and he has to die because of that. So, but he, Krishna doesn't neglect Bhishma's bhakti because of his wrong decisions. And Krishna does not in the name of bhakti neglect his wrong decisions also. His wrong decisions have consequences. If somebody has diabetes and they have this gulab jamun prasad. This is prasad. Yes, and you take prasad and you say, oh, you get a diabetic attack. But this was prasad. Well, when the rice was prasad, isn't it? So, we couldn't take the rice, but if I take gulab jamun, there will be material, material actions will have material consequences. So, we have to be aware of the material, but we don't have to keep our awareness stuff only at the material level. So, Bhishma is a devotee. Bhishma at one level operates according to categorical ethics, but at another level, he is devoted to Krishna. Karana, on the other hand, he rejects Krishna's offer. And he commits himself to the one who is dog, who is, you could say, doggedly opposed, obstinately opposed to Krishna and Krishna's devotees. And that's why although both of them operate according to categorical ethics, still their teacher is very different. So for all of us, what does this mean? Now we all want to function in the world in a way that we move toward Krishna and we help others move toward Krishna. And how do we do that? That requires maturity. And because maturity means we, we have certain rules which we want to follow, which is important. But more important than following the rules is keeping in mind the purpose of the rules. And seeing through the situation, how can I move toward Krishna? How can I get this person to move toward Krishna? So, as devotees, we try to avoid food with onion garlic. So once the devotees in India had been invited to a, like, a person's house and Prabhupada was also gone to the house and uh, there they saw that the food had been cooked with onion garlic. Now what to do? Now one of the devotees said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada there is onion, onion in this food. Prabhupada said there is no onion in this food. He says no Prabhupada there is onion in this food. Prabhupada said again, there is no onion in this food. And finally this devotee he actually took some piece of onion and showed it to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, there is onion here. <laughs> Prabhupada said, there is no onion in this one. <laughs> Prabhupada was so grave. The devotee became silent after that. And then, Prabhupada, after that, they all took that food. And then they came back. And then Prabhupada told them, for a pious Indian family, if a sadhu comes to their house and honors food, that's a very, considered a very great thing. And if a sadhu goes away from their house without taking food, they consider that as a disaster. See, it was our mistake that we didn't tell them clearly in advance that we don't take food with onion garlic. So there is a rule. But the point of the rule is also to be considered. So again, I'm not again giving a license to eat food with onion garlic. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the point. The point here is that we can't simply impose rules on every situation. So Prabhupada can say, yes, we don't take food in garlic, but there, if we are going to alienate people so much that they feel it's a disaster for them, then better be careful. Better be careful. So the, we, Prabhupada didn't, Prabhupada gave very strongly categories. This is what you have to do, this is what you should not do. But Prabhupada did not operate based on categorical ethics. He operated based on contextual ethics. So what will bring this person closer to Krishna? That's what he looked at and that's what he focused on. In a way by which, intelligently, he could bring people to Krishna. So once Prabhupada was invited to a Akhara. It's like Akhara is a, you could say, the Indian version of a gymnasium. <laughs> and there were, all, there were people who were doing the physical body building and they had a picture of Hanuman. I was wondering what will Prabhupada speak over there? <laughs> no, this is all bodily consciousness and no, Prabhupada said that all of you are building your body, that's very good. In a society, Kshatriyas are needed. They also need to protect society from wrongdoers. And your idea is Hanuman? Do you know Hanuman also chanted the name of Ram? So then Prabhupada says, while you are doing your sit-ups or push-ups, Ram, 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 Ram. <laughs> So, Prabhupada appreciated what they were doing. 
He didn't say, what is this? You are simply building your body. He didn't say that. He appreciated what they were doing. And they elevated them to work. They had to bring Krishna into them. So, when we are functioning in our life, we also, we, we first get education to know what is categorical ethics. And this is right, this is wrong. It's very important. But when we are functioning in our life, we have to look at the, our intent, we have to look at the consequence of what we are going to do. And then we act accordingly. That way, we will move toward Krishna and we will take others toward Krishna. And even if sometimes we make some wrong choices, if our purpose is good, Krishna will give us the intelligence to understand, okay, this choice was not the best thing, uh, change your course and move forward. So we keep the purpose in mind and by that purpose, we can get guided from Krishna, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Krishna will give us the intelligence by which we can come to Him. So I will summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on the topic of how do we know what is the right thing to do. And in that context, I, talked, I started by talking about broadly how we talk about values. Values reflect what is valuable for us. We all have to make decisions and some decisions are difficult uh, because sometimes what is the right thing to do is difficult to know. Now when that happens, when moral crisis is, where one choice is moral, another is immoral. Ethical crisis, both choices are right, but which is more right? So we need not just the right values, but we need the right hierarchy of values. So when Arjuna asks, what is dharma? Krishna doesn't give a simple answer because that answer would not be universal. Krishna gives a philosophy within which there is a hierarchy of values explained. And then Arjuna can make wise choices. So what is this? I talked about the two conceptions of ethics is categorical and contextual. So the Mahabharata reflects how characters move from categorical to contextual ethics. Categorical ethics means this is right, this is wrong and that's all there is to it. Contextual means yes, there are categories but I also have to consider intent and consequence. So Yudhishthir starts with categorical ethics but you could say evolves towards contextual ethics. Um, Bhishma and Karana stay with categorical ethics all the time. We talked about Yudhishthir's gambling was a movement of weakness. Duryodhan had not weakness but wickedness. So weakness needs to be overlooked, but wickedness needs to be countered. And uh, sometimes bad people may do good things, that doesn't make them good. And good people may do, may do bad things, that doesn't make them bad. And in between the black and white and black are the shades of grey. So if you see Karana, he operated on categorical ethics and he ended up, he was he had some weakness and he was attached to the Duryodhan, who was wicked. And that, that made him act wickedly. So he actively instigated wickedness. Now Bhishma also operated according to categorical ethics and he got caught in technicalities, Nyamagra. But he never actively became wicked. So his characters are completely higher, at a very higher level than Karana's. And all of them are, special, are extraordinary characters. So at an operational level, Bhishma did make a wrong choice based on categorical ethics. But at a spiritual level, it's like Dr. Bada, uh, computer, you can see it's functioning at various levels as simply a data and data storage device or as an information processing device as a decision guiding device depending on how much access you have to the data and the resources of the computer. So at a higher level, Bhishma acted to please Krishna. How to please Krishna? By demonstrating that even if a person as lustrous as him takes the side of a dharma, still he will fail because dharma will ultimately win. And also by giving uh, Krishna an experience of virya by fighting against him, by becoming an instrument for Krishna to demonstrate to the world how much Krishna loves his devotees, that Krishna is ready to break his word also for his devotees sake. And finally, Krishna rewarded Mishma by giving his own darshan at the moment of his death and receiving instruction from him. So for us, when we are trying to practice in our lives, we first get the education to understand categorical ethics. But then, like Shri Prabhupada was sensitive to context, we also act in a way that not simply applying rules rigidly in life, but seeing the purpose of the rules, which is for ourselves to go towards Krishna and to help others move towards Krishna and then acting accordingly. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yes. Are there any questions? Yes. My question is, you know, the, you talked about 
lot of uh, two kind of ethics that are really relevant. So when Google was in front of the government, in front of the government, they sat down and done nothing. So why did they not move from categorical to contextual ethics to contextual? See, when Duryodhana slipped and fell, at that time the Pandavas remained silent. Okay, <clears throat> yes, uh, it's uh, generally, see, there are different levels. Normally, if somebody, we see somebody slipping and falling, we would immediately run and help them to pick them up or help them in whatever way we can. But if somebody is already very puffed up and proud, and then that person slips and falls. Then what happens? There's a part of us which is annoyed because of their arrogance. And when a puffed up person falls, it is just, okay, that's what you deserve. Now that's not what, now when everybody started laughing, it was not with a malicious intent. It is just innocent. And Yudhishthira said, don't laugh. And then immediately he ordered his attendants to take some, some towels for him to try. But in that time, yes, they did laugh. But it was not with a malicious intent. And anyway, even if it was, even if we agree for argument's sake, that okay, it was a mistake. But you have to have a sense of proportion. When we slip and fall down, and somebody laughs at us, and as a revenge for that, you dishonor an honorable lady by disrobing her, there's no sense of proportion. Even if somebody has done something wrong and you want to get back. Mm -hmm. Justice means that the, the retribution is in proportion to the wrongdoing. Not in proportion to the anger that is felt about the wrong. So, yeah, so it, was, it was innocent, it was just circumstantial. And even if it is a mistake, what Duryodhan did in response was, was horrendous, completely disproportionate. Okay. I did not know. 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 When I got married, one day later, we took a vow to protect her work, is that right? Or my daughter. Okay. okay. Because that's the that's a really reason why they were supposed to come to work. Okay. That's the main reason. And we could say also this, that in Mohawar, the character of Drupal is very important. Okay, just let me understand. Is this a comment or is this a question? Like, is this a comment or is it a question? It's a comment. I am talking about my, my purpose. Then they need So, Drupadi is very important because in our life, we have a wife, we have a daughter, we have a mother, and so on. And so, we have seen that over a period of time, if you see, go back to 10,000 years back, or whatever it is. There's always just a conflict, get to us, who get from um, women. Rape and you will see everyone. Yeah. Is that right? So, so the thing is that I think the, this character has yeah. important on it. You know what? And I think the fate to have is a witness. It's all made I didn't understand. It's okay. Yes. Let's quickly respond to that like one minute and we'll finish then. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So was it weakness for the for the Pandavas to when their wife was being dishonored to stay passive over there? Yeah, that's how Draupadi felt about it. She felt very much let down by them. But it was Yudhishthir's sense of self-restraint at that time. Because he felt that I have been, I'm bound to them. So it's also a complex situation because if he has sold himself, they are his masters, he can't oppose them. So it was, uh, it was the viciousness of Duryodhan to do that. It was the horrifying passivity of the Kshatriyas over there to not oppose that forcefully. And of course, it was the mis it was uh, the error of Yudhishthir to have gambled in the first place. But rather than seeing that as a failure, we see that even that Yudhishthir and the Pandavas were ready to tolerate. And even after that, Duryodhana kept provoking. 
So if somebody is that uh, incorrigible, then we have to, they have to be treated, they have to be uh, exemplarily punished. And that's what happened in Okay, You can talk maybe after the class now. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, I have written a few books, just like I talked on the Ramayana. I have written a book on, sorry, I talked on Mahabharata, but it's a book on the Ramayana, Wisdom from the Ramayana on Life and Relationships. So about 20 incidents from the Ramayana I told and analyzed to draw various life lessons. And when bad good people do bad things, how do we act? And why was Sita sent away even after she was won back by Ram in the war? Question there and answer. There's also a book on Gita wisdom through quotes, like I spoke certain statements, quotable statements during the class. Weakness can be forgiven, wickedness can't be forgiven. So things like that, you will see quotes inspired by the Bhagavad 365 quotes. And there are several other books also. If any of you want, you can have them outside. Thank you. Hare Krishna.